We're going to have the CEO, Jesse Tudela, who is our Chief Ancillary Services, who oversees the testing, and Stephanie, who is our epidemiologist. We'll be talking about testing availability, as well as who should get tested. CEO, if you could please take it away. Okay, yeah, half a day until everyone. Um, just this, you, you guys can hear me, right? Okay, so just wanted to um, talk about testing. And um, at least, uh, at least for my part, and I, I asked uh, Mr. Uh, Jesse Tudela uh, also to be in this uh, call as he is leading the charge for getting uh, individuals tested out in the community, as well as he handles basically all testing. And we want to talk about that and answer your questions and concerns of individuals that have brought uh, to your attention. Um, you know, we understand that everyone wants to get tested. We want to test you, but we also also need to do it at the right time. If a person tests positive on a screening test and is referred for a confirmatory test, and we, we know that there's antigen testing available also in the CNMI, um, they should quarantine until they receive the results, right? So one of the things, the, the reason why I'm mentioning that is that, you know, we know that everybody wants to get tested and you feel like you're, you're, you, you want to line up and get tested, we also need and, and you think that you're you're possibly a, a contact of a person, uh, we again, we would like for you to contact the contact tracers so that they can um, ensure that you don't have to line up in the in the community based testing. And um, for those that are lining up, you know, if you're trying to wait for a result, again, it's it's necessary that you understand that testing is determined by the time of your, when when the time of your exposure occurred. So we it, it is is it is essential that when you do get tested, that um, especially if you were if you feel like you were exposed, that you do quarantine as well. So those are things that we wanted to kind of um, you know answer your questions about testing the availability of testing. Um, uh, we, we wanted to emphasize again the need for um, individuals that feel uh, are experiencing symptoms that they they do access care um, for to to get tested because um, again you know one of the things that we did early on in, back in 2020 was that when um, there was an availability of applying for the presumptive eligibility CHTC uh, went through that uh, working with the governor's office pushed for the, the presumptive eligibility to be available in the CNMI to remove any financial barriers to accessing getting tested, especially for those that have experience or experiencing symptoms. So uh, just wanted to uh, continue to emphasize that there is testing availability, um, but you know, um, we will try to uh, have uh, more tests available in community, but we also want to let you understand at least that, that you know, in regards to contact tracing, uh, that's, uh, there's a lot of, of, uh, emphasis on that because we want to get to the uh, especially that are that are uh, actually have evidence of exposure. So um, that's one of the things that I wanted to share. And I'll turn it over to members of our team as well. All right, thank you, CEO. This is Jesse Tudela, Chief of Ancillary Services, and I do handle the. COVID-19 uh, testing uh, for the CNMI task force and CACC. Um, just for a brief history and the background is that CHCC and the CNMI task force has been conducting testing for since COVID started. And that includes also border testing, such as airport upon arrival, fifth day testing, and as well as uh, ships arrival uh, who are on for arrival and fifth day testing. So travel bubble is the new one as well that we are also conducting. And then of course, community-based testing, and which was happening every Wednesday. And then of course, school-based testing with the antigen test, which is running on a quarterly basis. Last uh, uh, trigger point for this was last week's uh, round two of screening. Uh, for school-based testing. The first round that we did was back in August, right at the beginning of the opening of the school year. 
So that's the background of what we are conducting tests. And it's basically from screening to even diagnostic that our laboratory does on a confirmatory platform, or in other words, uh, um, EUA platforms. And that is GeneXpert, Abbott ID, or the BioFire. So uh, the screening test that is being used, if you're wondering, it is the Sojin Diplex Q. That was, of course, purchased, uh, procured from the beginning of COVID-19 with the CNMI Task Force and the governor's office. So that's the brief history of what we do, what we test, and we test individuals who basically are, are meeting those categories. Over. Um, I'm not, I'm Stephanie. Yeah. Go ahead, Stephanie. Thank you. Thanks, CEO. Uh, I just wanted to again reiterate what uh, Jesse and, and CEO have been saying is that really we want to make sure that testing is available to those who who are are, are at risk and are you know the folks that we are most um, concerned about, um, particularly folks who are close contacts and our contact tracing team is uh, working you know, day in and day out, uh, all day long, all night long, identifying uh, contacts and uh, determining how uh, their risk level um, and making sure that we're testing um, and quarantining folks who, who are the higher risk uh, as well as low risk. Um, we're really having a very comprehensive contact tracing effort here. Um, but we also want to make sure that uh, testing is available uh, for folks to go ahead and self-monitor for symptoms. You know, if you are experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, uh, fever, cough, shortness of breath. Um, there's a nice list on the CDC website as well. Um, these are the symptoms that we are also seeing among our cases. Um, and so if you know if you are experiencing symptoms, we encourage people to go ahead and access testing um, even if they haven't been uh, identified as a close contact. But rest assured, all of the close contacts, I assure you, are, are being identified by our teams. And if um, a person who believes they may have had contact with the case does not receive a call, uh, I promise it's not because we missed you. We are doing very thorough contact tracing uh, work here. Um, but also if you know folks uh, do feel like they've had contact with a case, I encourage them to self-monitor for any symptoms. And if they do develop symptoms, to go ahead and access that testing um, that through our community-based uh, screening. Uh, but really those are the, our, our priority you know, the groups that are most recommended by the CDC for um, prioritizing our testing for. Um, that's it for me. Thank you, CEO. Back to you. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Jesse. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I know I know you guys are getting a lot of calls, and, and we're getting the same thing even through our website, um, you know, about uh, how do we access testing. Um, you know, again, if you're, what really concerns us is if you're, if you're going to go get tested, and then you go out and not quarantine, that doesn't even, you know, it basically defeats the purpose. If you really are worried about it, then, um, you know, it really, it's, it's really important to know that if you are, you feel that you're a contact, um, you know, con best to contact the contact tracers directly and let them know if you're connected and then they can actually arrange for the testing as well. So it doesn't, so you don't have to go through the, the line of the CBT and we know that slots are limited. So anyway, I see some hands raised already. So excuse me day. <laughs> no All right. Um, so thanks for joining again. So we'll, go, we'll start with you first, and then we'll head to Tomas. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Can everyone hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Sorry. I just I just wanted to ask for the officials to please turn on their cameras for the <laughs> for TV purposes if it's possible, before we start um, no, with the Q&A. Of course not. One second. One second, <laughs> Okay, thank you. Awesome. Yay, thank you. Okay, so uh, my first question is, could you give us um, a number of how many um, people have registered for the CBT testing? Okay, I'll, I'll answer that. So we have, we normally have total of 376 slots 
So CBT, so we did start this on Friday. As you recall, that will be the date of October 29, uh, Friday. So we started off with 376, but opened up a little bit more to about 470. And then we did Sunday again, another 376 slots. Monday, another 376 slots and on and on. So roughly on average, about 470. And we are closed for today. It was fully booked already by last week, Saturday. Friday, this coming Friday, there's another CBT. That is also full at 376. We'll, uh, we will be opening up another 94 at 4 p.m. So if you're watching this and you get to that online and it's closed, it means it's full again. So the next available CBT will be Monday, next week. We'll be putting out a flyer, thanks to Gil. Uh, it will be out on Monday uh, over at Moranis Resort, 12 p.m. to 3 p.m., another 470 slots. And then on Wednesday, Moranis Resort again, another 470 slots. So at least I could tell you that we're testing on screening CBT close to 500, but that does not include the PUIs that we daily test as well. Travelers that we daily test as well. And who knows, a boat or a crew that comes in as well daily or every week. Over. All right, okay, thank you. Um, that's all my questions for now. I'm going to put on my mask because that's the dress code. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm by myself. Okay. <laughs> all right. Hi, everyone. Uh, just a few questions. Um, thanks for providing the numbers on how many slots were filled. Are you able to tell us how many people you've had to turn away? We do not keep track because we only accept those who are registered on site to be swapped. So we do not know who are trying to get in without any registration. We are only swapping those who are registered. So the answer is no, I don't think we ever rejected. If you can get online to register, you won't be able to get a confirmation ID. Over. Just to follow up on that, so you're not you're not having to turn people away on site. No, we don't because you have to to enter the premises. You have to have a confirmation number. Okay, and I uh, just wanted to ask you, under the best case scenario, how many people are you able to test every single day? I know uh, there's. Uh, some rest time involved with the machines and whatnot, and uh, rest time for frontliners uh, in terms of shifts. So best case scenario, how many people every day can you test? 500. Okay. And uh, just wanted to address a little bit about uh, maybe the urgency uh, for people filling the slots a little bit. Uh, CEO Munya, maybe uh, this might uh, be for you. Um, maybe folks want to get tested, right, to just go to work or, you know, interact with elders or other family households that are part of their life, uh, and they want to get tested just as, to have that peace of mind. Uh, what's your message to them? Because uh, it seems like now uh, your only, now, uh, your only, only message is to get tested only if it's urgent, right? Uh, so what do you have to say to those who want to get tested for peace of mind so that they can have a family dinner or continue going to work? Well, again, I mentioned about testing being determined by the time of exposure, right? I mean, I mean, at least with the, the, the determining if you're positive, it really depends on your time of exposure. So is it is it really, um, you know, th when you are tested, it's it may actually result in a false sense of security because you think you're not exposed, you think you got a, ne you got a negative test, 
But again, the the if, especially for fully vaccinated, remember we are 80 per, 83% uh, vaccinated. For fully vaccinated, your when it shows, um, when it shows that you are positive and it, that shows that you have been exposed and you are infected, you won't be able to see that until the fifth day after exposure, uh, okay. likely the fifth day. I mean, there's there's three to five days and five to seven days, but again, it's really dependent on your exposure. So when we quarantine individuals, we actually, when you are considered a contact, a close contact, we put you in, uh, you know, we, we provide the uh, the quarantine site for you to to wait out there, um, and then we test you out. So, you know, peace of mind is I understand, but it's it's really in some ways kind of gives you a false sense of of security, because you think you're you're safe, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're negative. You know, there, that's why it's 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 critical that when we make even when we make the orders for individuals to test out or be tested, um, you know, let's say, for example, they're negative the first time, we we have to follow up with a, a second test. And sometimes, and a lot of times, that, that if especially if they are really exposed to a, a close contact, is that they show up on, on day five, or sometimes even day three, or even day seven, you know, so I, I understand that you want to do that. But, you know, again, it's, it's really, it, it doesn't mean that you are good to go and, and, you know, spend time, you know. So that's what I'm saying. If you're testing, then you need to quarantine as well, you know, at least. And and I don't I don't believe people are doing that. People are actually just lining up, waiting for the test result, and they go about, go about their merry way. And that doesn't work. Testing doesn't do that. Testing doesn't mean that you're negative and that you're negative for the rest of the day. You know, you need to... You need to stay put if you're saying that you are you are concerned about about exposing others, then yes, go ahead and test it. But you need to quarantine and wait until your result and not go out your merry way. And, and you know, so that's that's those are things that I think there's a misunderstanding on what exactly what the test does. It's 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 at that certain time point of time that um, that is essential for us to determine whether you were exposed or not and um i see you know uh, stephanie can also chime in on that but basically that's the the concern that we have is that you're testing but you're not necessarily uh you know keeping waiting for that result at home like you should be <laughs> yeah i just wanted to ask two quick follow-up questions to that uh last we checked uh the test kits from south korea we got sixty thousand of those uh, what's the inventory right now for those specific test kits and just testing in general? Are we running out anytime soon? No. Well, I, I, I'll I answer didn't that, think so. Uh, see you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So this go is ahead, Jesse Tudela. Uh, the answer. The answer is no. We are getting restock of supplies uh just last this past saturday we received another set of supplies so no the answer is no okay so no concern there. And, and, and then a uh, question oh. no i just wanted to I, I wanted to add on you know and then also let stephanie go ahead and chime in on that question is that um if you are talking about testing you may not you may probably be tested more than once so that's just just to be clear, you know, that's the other thing too. Uh, don't, you know, again, I, I, I think people misunderstand that testing, once they're tested, they're negative, okay, I can go out and do anything. That's really not the right uh, purpose for the testing, <laughs> you know, so anyway, um, but but it does help, it does help to find those that really do have exposure and they don't know about it. Um, so, you know, it's good to do it, but, you know, again, the, the concern we have is I think um, after they get tested is, you know, what do they do after? And that's the concern that I have. Absolutely, Theo. And if I can just quickly chime in here, I just want to reiterate that testing is not a prevention strategy. It's being tested isn't going to prevent you from spreading it to your family or in a gathering. The best prevention um, we have is our vaccination. And if you can, if you haven't gotten your booster dose and you're eligible, I would encourage you to go ahead and, and um, 
register to receive your booster dose. If you haven't received your first dose, go ahead and register for that. And if you haven't completed your series yet and you're eligible, I would also recommend that. Um, but testing is a point in time, sort of a snapshot, and it can help us identify transmission and, and help us break those chains of transmission, but it's uh, still not prevention. And we really need to focus on uh, ensuring that we're preventing those chains of transmission from continuing by vaccination and, of course, our three Ws, emphasizing that those are our prevention methods, washing your hands, uh, watching your distance. Uh, for those folks who are, you know, uh, wanting to, uh, for peace of mind, the best way that they can protect their families is by, you know, uh, at your next vaccination, you know, using some of those three W's, doing their best to social distance between yourself uh, and maybe uh, even self quarantining yourself so that uh, you can protect your family best. Um, but those would be just some uh, additions there, just uh, that testing isn't going to prevent um, uh, transmission. It's really those other ways that we can uh, stop those chains from expanding and, and, and transmitting it to those that are loved ones and our friends and families. So just wanted to add that on there. Perfect, per perfect answer. Per that's a perfect answer, actually. Thank you very much. Exactly what it was. She said it in a better way. Use the use her verbiage. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, just a last question before passing it on uh, uh, to uh, um, Stephanie. Five hundred tests a day, best case scenario. Given what we've known from this outbreak, is that an adequate number? Uh, I'd say that testing 1% of our population every single day is a pretty impressive number. The last uh, census uh, data that I have, I haven't seen the most updated census numbers, but uh, you know, we have 50,000 approximately folks and we're testing 1% every day. That's really impressive. Um, of course, you know, if we could uh, up our testing capacity, I mean, you know, the better for it, but I think that's already a pretty uh, excellent um, testing capacity. And of course, I know our team is always working towards you know, improving uh, our laboratory uh, efforts all, all the time. And, uh, but already our testing capacity is, is quite high. Jesse, if you have anything you. to add, please go ahead. Um, no, you hit it uh, right on target. Um, the whole idea of testing is mostly if, if you have the symptoms, as CDC is recommending, get tested. If, and especially if you're fully vaccinated, and you feel you have symptoms uh, um, or you're exposed, get tested, but wait for five to seven days from the last exposure. Contact tracers will inform you when you should, uh, what it could is that you're a close contact. That's when I feel individuals should consider testing is when contact tracers uh, uh, notify them that they are potential contacts to a known case. Don't Thank case. you. Over. Thank you. Over. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, and and that message about vaccination is really really important. And so, I mean, that's you know, how do you stop the spread by getting vaccinated? And 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 yeah, so that's that's important. Very important. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. I just wanted to quickly add. I forgot to mention. Not only is it helping uh, stop the spread, but vaccines save lives. Uh, we're seeing that our cases. Um, are, you know, very mild symptoms. Uh, we're not seeing, um, for the cases up until yesterday, we hadn't seen uh, any hospitalizations since our uh, last community transmission. And, and so that's really the, a testament to our high vaccination coverage here in the CNMI. Um, we're able to uh -huh. you know, reduce the risk of severe disease. And I think that that's also a reason to uh, go ahead and not only to break transmission, but also protect yourself and, and the folks around you um, from severe uh, uh, disease. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, Tomas, thanks for your question. We'll move along to Kay. You have the floor. Hey, Kay, you there? All right. I, I guess if that's all the questions you folks have, then we can end it here. Kay, uh, if you can I ask uh, one more question? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, and uh, Stephanie, maybe you and, have uh, maybe, understanding yeah. is that you yeah. came from uh, Guam, right? You uh, you were in Guam previously, and you've helped the epidemiologist uh, Dr. Ann Pobetsky here, right? Uh, if that's correct. And so 
Um, you know, the, there's a CDC team here on Guam to investigate the DOAs, I'm sure you know. Um, and in no way do I want to compare a situation that's not happening in the CMI. Um, but uh, given that also Guam has a high vaccination rate and still a high positivity rate, or is that something of concern to you? I, I, I know you're not, uh, a, you know, you, you can't predict the future here, but uh, I wanted your scientific, uh, you know, uh, expertise on whether or not that is a concern looking ahead, given um, we're, what we're seeing on Guam. Sorry, Tomas, I just wanted to clarify your question. Are you asking about uh, concerns about dead on arrival? Or are you, I, uh, concerns I'm about uh, increased positives, even with high vaccination rates. Sure, and that's why I, my colleagues on the CDC are uh, in, in Guam. I think there's a bit of a different uh, sort of situation. C the CNMI has uh, been, was, had no community transmission for such a long time. Uh, whereas Guam hasn't really seen the same sort of uh, situation, a different uh, vaccination. Although we both have high coverage rates, I think there is a, a difference between the CNMI and, and uh, Guam when it comes to the COVID sort of situation uh, that we've both experienced. Um, I wouldn't say that I have any a definitive answer on why our situations may be different, uh, where we're seeing transmission continuing um, in Guam. Uh, versus the CNMI, though. Um, I don't have any, we haven't done any scientific studies on that yet, so I have no definitive answers there. But I would say that uh, I think very a bit plainly, CNMI and Guam have had different experiences with COVID and sort of the amount of uh, transmission that we've seen on the transmission that we've seen on the Thanks. CEO, did you have anything to add? Oh, no, I just wanted to add uh, information about the uh, vaccinations for children, if that's, um, if anyone's interested. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just joking. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> we are expecting shipment to arrive on November 6th. And um, once we receive them, we are actually rolling it out on the same day. So, um, you know, uh, that's Saturday. <clears throat> so we will push out the message if it's actually arrival, you know, um, as soon as we get it, we will push out the message about um, the availability. It will be available at, at the multipurpose center for uh, children five to 11. As you all know, there is uh, approval already by um, a CDC director and also as recommended by the ACIP committee, um, you know, giving a unanimous decision to, to approve the uh, uh, vaccinations for children five to 11. So we're, we're rolling it out and hopefully we'll get to the schools when, uh, when they reopen. So uh, looking forward to that. So just kind of pu push out the message about that as well. All right, thank you, CEO. I have the question from Kay. How do you determine how many slots to